Mahan from Tata Institute, India. And the title of his talk is Canon Thurston Maps. Thank you. Right. Uh, hmm. Okay. All right. Okay, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, and the chance to visit this uh, extremely interesting country. Um, so, so I'll come to the title of the talk uh, a while later. Uh, for the time being, I'll, I'll start with uh, something that uh, has been repeated several times during the course of this uh, Congress, uh, namely geometric structures in dimension two. So, uh, Geometric structures in dimension two on surfaces come in a whole variety of flavors, and you can think of them from the point of view of differential geometry. So by surfaces, I'll, 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 let me just state this at the very beginning. By surfaces, I'll mean closed orientable surfaces, okay? So from the differential geometry point of view, you're really looking at constant curvature metrics, so if it's genus zero, you're looking at uh, uh, constant curvature plus one. If it's genus one, you're looking at constant curvature zero. And if it's higher genus, which is what's going to interest us for most of this talk, you're looking at constant curvature minus one. These things can equivalently be regarded as representations into the isometry group of these uh, spaces. So spaces with constant curvature. So since I'll be focusing on higher genus, we are really looking at discrete faithful representations of the fundamental group of a surface into the corresponding Lie group, which is the projectivized SL2R. So SL2R and you quotient out by the center, which is plus minus identity, and that turns out to be the isometry group of the hyperbolic plane, and that's where we are looking at our group. So the first is a more geometric point of view. The second is, well, discrete subgroups of Lie groups, or you can think of it as representations into the Lie group. Okay. Uh, now we come to a slightly different point of view. Oh. And this is the, the complex analytic point of view or complex geometric point of view. From this point of view, we are re really looking at Riemann surfaces, so which means uh, equipped with charts such that the transition functions are complex analytic. From the algebraic geometry point of view, finally, we are looking at solution sets to algebraic equations in projective space such that the solution set is smooth and complex one-dimensional. So you have this uh, whole range of uh, perspectives on geometric structures on surfaces, and fortunately for us, these various perspectives talk a lot to each other, and the theorem that sets up the dictionary between these various perspectives is the Poincare-Coebe-Klein uniformization theorem, okay? So basically that theorem says that whether, I mean, that there's an exact correspondence between Riemann surfaces up to, comp up to isomorphism and uh, constant curvature minus one uh, metrics up to isometry, okay? So the goal of this talk will, uh, at, at least as an analogy, the, the point would be to extend this up by one real dimension. So we are going to say what the corresponding story is in real three dimensions. Okay. But before we come to the story in three dimensions, I would like to show some examples of what these geometric structures look like explicitly. And the first picture that you see at the top uh, is something that has already occurred in Nicolas Bergeron's talk. Uh, that's supposed to represent um, a coxeter group, a reflection group, in the pentagon, which is the fundamental tile, which tiles the whole hyperbolic plane. So that disk is supposed to be a model of the hyperbolic plane, and you take a group that, so, so those pentagons there have all equal sides and all angles are right angles, and you reflect on, on, on the various sides and you get a tiling of the plane. Uh, 
Another group, I mean, closely related, but not quite the same. I mean, it's, it's the fundamental group of, the, of a surface. So, uh, so, there's, so what you see in the second picture below is supposed to represent um, a metric of constant curvature minus one on the closed genus two surface. Okay? These, I mean, you don't quite get the surface downstairs from the surface upstairs, but what you can do is you can pass to a finite index torsion-free subgroup of the group that you get at the top, and you're going to get some surface of large genus, possibly not two, but so these, the, the point is these, these two examples that you have here are, are closely related. They're not entirely unrelated. Okay. So I think now it's time to move up dimensions by one. And so let's come to the main theme. And uh, so now we are looking at, instead of hyperbolic plane, we are look, looking at hyperbolic three space. Okay. The isometry group, uh, you just change R to C. So look at SL2C, two cross two complex matrices of determinant one, mod out by the center, which is again just, yeah, it's mod out by the center, and then you're going to get the isometry group of the next simplest symmetric space, so from hyperbolic plane to hyperbolic three space. What are we looking at? So in this particular slide, I'll focus more on the representation of the discrete subgroup of Lie group perspective. So we are looking at the space of discrete faithful representations of the fundamental group of a surface of higher genus into this Lie group. Yeah. And uh, just as, not just as a set, we are going to equip this collection of representations with a fairly natural topology. And that topology is, think of it as just the topology of pointwise convergence. What do I mean? So, for the time being, just, uh, yeah, so the notation that I'll be using is, uh, I'll be using gamma for the image of the representation of a, so if, if, you, if you have a discrete faithful representation, I'll denote the image by gamma. So what's the topology that we are looking at? Uh, this is called the algebraic topology. So a sequence of representations in PSL to C, so from the fundamental group of the surface into PSL to C, converges algebraically if fix some element of this discrete group. So for every G in pi 1s, look at its image under the representation along the sequence, and you demand that it converges. So a sequence of representations rho n converges to a representation rho infinity if it converges pointwise on this discrete group. Okay? So just just collection of two cross two matrices converging entrywise to the limiting matrix. Okay. Um, so you equip now, so, so now you have a space, it's been equipped with the topology. Uh, the point is that to represent this, there's, there's a silly way of changing representations, which means basically you take some element of the ambient Lie group and conjugate your representation. So that silly way of uh, making representations different, we just identify. So you take the space of all representations equipped with this topology and mod out by conjugation. So you identify two representations if they are globally conjugate. And that space of representations with this topology, with this quotient topology, that's denoted as AHFS. A stands for algebraic, H stands for hyperbolic. What does that have to do with Teichmuller theory, which was there in the, in the first slide? So that's what, that was our guiding motive. Uh, in dimension two, which means if you replace PSL to C by PSL to R, you're just going to get back Teichmuller space. Yeah? So really, this age of S is what we are after. It's elements. Hmm. Okay. So that was the representation theory point of view. But I, we started off, I, I think this uh, time, timer has gone off. Uh, okay, fine, thanks. Right. All right. <laughs> okay, so, so now we were, we were looking at it from the 
the, the representation, the discrete subgroup's point of view, let's look at it from the metric point of view, the differential geometric point of view. So what we are looking at are quotients of hyperbolic three space by this discrete group. And it all starts off with this fundamental theorem of Thurston and Bonahan, which says that topologically nothing unexpected happens. So if you have a Kleinian surface group, which means, uh, as, as Nicola point, pointed out in his talk, these, were, these are ex these examples of discrete subgroups of uh, PSL2C were discovered by Poincaré and called Kleinian groups. Um, so, so, so these are, so, so a Kleinian group, which is isomorphic abstractly to the fundamental group of a surface, we'll also call that a Kleinian surface group. So take a Kleinian surface group acting on hyperbolic three space, the quotient is just a product. It's a product of a surface, a closed surface with the real line. So topologically, nothing unexpected is happening. So, but geometrically, there's a lot of variety, and what we are after are different hyperbolic structures on the same underlying topological manifold with different structures. Okay. So, uh, so the three-dimensional analog of Teichmuller theory becomes the study of hyperbolic structures on this. Just as in two dimensions you were studying different hyperbolic structures on the surface, now you are studying different hyperbolic structures on the surface cross R. Okay? Um, but there's one extra feature that comes in, basically because you have a surface which is a two-dimensional object, now in surface cross R, topologically, which is a three-dimensional object. So the extrinsic geometry, how does, this, how does the surface sit inside this three-manifold? That becomes important. So we just need a little bit of setup. So, you, so your manifold M now is surface cross R. Topologically, just include the surface as a topological section. That gives you a homotopy equivalence. And fix a base point. So fix. So there's, there's no canonical choice geometrically. Topologically, it's just an arbitrary section. Uh, fix some hyperbolic metric, some arbitrary hyperbolic metric on the surface, and uh, lift everything to the universal cover, choose a base point, call it little o, and your inclusion i then lifts to an embedding of the universal cover of the surface to the universal cover of the three-manifold. So it gives you a map from the hyperbolic plane into hyperbolic three space. And let's say base points are taken to base points, so little o goes to capital O. Um, so representations from this point of view come in, now we'll, we'll, so from this extrinsic geometry point of view, representations come in two different flavors, the easy ones and the not so easy ones. So, so broadly, I mean, there's a, there's a dichotomy, and uh, the two kinds are, as with, in, as in many cases, uh, these are, these, these have a certain property P, and those that have, do not have it. So the first class of representations are what we'll be calling quasi-Fuchsian. They have a bunch of names depending on what perspective you're looking at them from. Quasi-Fuchsian, convex co-compact, undistorted, or quasi-isometrically embedded. It's a whole bunch of names, refers to the same thing. What does it mean? It basically says that the distance that you get by measuring distance between two points in the hyperbolic plane and the distance between those two points sitting inside hyperbolic three space, those are comparable. More precisely, there exists some constants, k, epsilon, which could be quite large, such that the following holds. So more precisely, k is greater than or equal to one, epsilon is greater than or equal to zero, such that this holds. Hmm. So take the two, two distance between orbit points, g acting on little o, h acting on little o, one by k times that distance minus epsilon is less than or equal to the distance in the three-dimensional space, is less than or equal to k times the distance in two dimensions plus epsilon. So basically, if epsilon was zero, you would get by Lipschitz, but you have some additive discrepancy as well. 
So the space of all these representations, that's um, called quasi-Fuchsian space, it turns out to be homeomorphic to the product of two Teichmuller spaces. Where this homeomorphism comes from, I'll return to later on in the talk. This is a famous theorem of Bayes uh, from 1960. It's called the Simultaneous Uniformization Theorem. So at least you see, uh, um, in terms of words, I mean, that, that we are really uh, trying to generalize the two-dimensional theory to three dimensions. The diagonal slice here, that corresponds to exactly the Fuchsian representations that we had in dimension two. And then there are the representations which are not QI embedded. Uh, for the purposes of this slide, it's just QI embedded and not QI embedded, but there's a theorem here, and I am really going in a very non-chronological order. Basically, Bayes conjectured that the quasi-Fuchsian representations are dense in the space of all representations. Hmm, what's going on? Yeah. So all representations can be obtained as limits of these representations, limits in the sense of algebraic topology. Okay? So the, the topology that we talked about earlier. But for the time being, this theorem comes much later chronologically. Uh, just think of these as representations which are not QI embedded. I should point out that this second kind of representation is something which is entirely new in three dimensions. There's no real analog of this in lower dimensions. Um, so once you have one of these representations of the second kind, it's a surface cross R, and there are two different ends. There's a, the plus infinity end, there's a minus infinity end, and those ends can also be classified according to this one and two, those ends are also of the type uh, geometrically finite or quasi-Fuchsian or of the second, second kind, which are called degenerate. Okay, so now we've said something about the hyperbolic geometry and the representation points of view. What about the complex analytic point of view? And so here we go to the space at infinity of hyperbolic three space, which is the complex sphere. And what you see here is supposed to be the shadow of this discrete group acting now on the Riemann sphere. The point is that quasi-Fuchsian representations, hmm. what's going on? Ah. So the quasi-Fuchsian representations are precisely those representations for which the embedding of the hyperbolic plane into hyperbolic three space that we referred to in the previous slide, this extends to an embedding, a continuous embedding of the circle into the sphere. Um, the image of that circle is that fractal circle that you see in the picture, and that's an example of what's called a limit set. So a limit set is the set, set of accumulation points in the Riemann sphere of an orbit of a point. It's independent of the point in hyperbolic three space that you choose, and you can think of it, I mean, this is really the complex dynamic perspective, you can think of it as the locus of chaotic dynamics of the gamma action on the Riemann sphere. Um, for a quasi-Fuchsian group, this is another characterization. QI embedded in the interior gives rise to a limit set, which is topologically a circle. It turns out to have much more structure. We won't need it for the time being. Just think of it as a topological embedding of a circle. So now, how do you go from this? I mean, so, so we have these three different perspectives. How do you go between them? So how do we go from the complex analytic or complex dynamic perspective to the geometric perspective? Well, first, uh, before we come to that, uh, let me just say that so once you have a topological circle, by the Jordan curve theorem, this is going to split the, the Riemann sphere into two parts. These are going to be two topological disks, and your group is going to act leaving these two topological disks invariant. So which means that you can, so on the complement of this limit set, the group acts very nicely. It acts by conformal automorphisms, properly discontinuously, freely. And so these two topological disks 
They quotient down to Riemann surfaces. So you get two different complex analytic structures on the same, same underlying topological surface S. So we call these two complex structures tau 1 and tau 2. And this bears simultaneous uniformization that I referred to earlier, it establishes an isomorph, I mean, it, it is establish an, e uh, an equivalence between these quasi Fuchsian representations and these two, I mean, the products of these two Teichmuller spaces. So tau 1 varies in Teichmuller space, tau 2 varies in Teichmuller space. The products of Teichmuller space that you get is exactly the parameterization space. This is, this is how you get that, uh, get the map and bears proof that it's, it's an equivalence. So once you have this, now let's uh, try to go from the, from, from the, the complex analytics. So now let's, let's try to take this picture at infinity and try to extend it inwards. So the convex hull of the limit set is the smallest closed non-empty subset convex of, of hyperbolic three space, which is invariant under, under, under this discrete group gamma. So how do you construct that? So basically take pairs of points on the limit set, join it by geodesics, and then repeat the construction. So you get your smallest convex set, that's invariant under gamma, on that, gamma acts now uh, properly discontinuously. You're going to pass to a, co a compact quotient, and that compact quotient has a name. It's called the convex core. So mind that you started off with something, hyperbolic three space quotiented by gamma. That was a product of surface with R. But now you have, for quasi-Fuchsian guys, a compact guy. Yeah? And this compact guy, the topology is, again, fairly simple. Yeah, so the topology, okay, so this piece of paper was, my cheat sheet was causing problems. Okay, so uh, the convex core is homeomorphic to a product of a surface with the interval, okay? Now, this is the geometric way of looking at these things. Now, we can try to pass to limits of these guys. And so the way we want to pass to limits is a geometric perspective on, on these things. So what happens if this product the thickness of the convex core, so to speak, the thickness, I mean, that, that, that product that you see there, surface cross minus 1, 1, that's just a topological thing. There can be a large distance in terms of hyperbolic geometry between surface cross minus 1 and surface cross 1. What happens if that thickness goes off to infinity? So when the thickness of the convex core tends to infinity, you get You get two possibilities, just one side degenerates or both sides degenerate. So the interval minus 1, 1 can go to minus 1, infinity, or minus infinity, infinity. Accordingly, we have two different names for these two kinds of degenerations. The first kind, these are called simply degenerate manifolds. And the, the second kind, they were called, they used to be called totally degenerate. Now they are just called doubly degenerate. OK. so. So this is a geometric way of getting limits, right? What does this have to do with the original way of taking limits in the representation space? And that's what we are going to come to now. So just in terms of geometry, what you have is these three kinds of uh, uh, convex cores. The first is surface cross minus 1, 1. The second is surface cross, say, 0 or minus 1, comma infinity. And this third one is surface cross minus infinity, infinity. And um, a fundamental theorem of Thurston basic, basically says that if you look at these limits geometrically, you are going to land up with a representation into, hyperbolic three, uh, into the isometry group of hyperbolic three space. So these limits, whether they are thought of geometrically or whether thought, they are thought of algebraically, they really coincide. That's, a, that's a Thurston's famous double limit theorem from 1980. And uh, so, so this first word, limits exist, should think of as limits of representations, as a discrete faithful representation. So fine. So Thurston's double limit theorem now gives us, at the end of the day, a discrete faithful representation such that the convex score uh, just to sort of ease 
exposition, I'll just think of the doubly degenerate case. So that's it's fairly same symmetric, yeah? So both the minus infinity side and the plus infinity side, they are degenerate. Uh, what happens to the complex analytic point of view? Yeah? So you started off with a complex analytic point of view, you took a quasi-Fuchsian group, you constructed a con convex hull, passed to the quotient, let this compact guy become thicker and thicker and degenerate to something that extends to infinity on both sides. You get a representation from the double limit theorem. What happens to simultaneous uniformization? Uh, I think Bears had remarked I mean, he knew that these limiting representations did exist, yeah? And I think he had remarked that uh, the debris of the Riemann surface is now lost in the limit set, yeah? So uh, basically what happens in this doubly degenerate case is that the, the fractal curve that you saw as a limit set of this convex co-compact guy, that fractal curve becomes more and more complicated. In the limit, it fills the whole sphere. So there's no domain of discontinuity. You don't have any Riemann surface at infinity. Well, what do you have? And so this is the question that we are now trying to address. What happens to the simultaneous uniformization perspective for these limits? And that's what brings us to the title of the talk. And uh, this is a picture from, from Thurston's paper um, where he posed a bunch of questions. Uh, and so essentially what well, um, so the, the, uh, I'll state the theorem, and then we'll, we'll, we'll say how that uh, matches up with, the, with, with what we are describing so far. So um, the theorem says that for all representations, if you look at the, the hyperbolic plane sitting inside hyperbolic three space, the inclusion extends to a continuous map from the circle to the sphere. OK? So what have we lost in going from quasi-Fuchsian representations to arbitrary, represent, arbitrary discrete faithful representations? We've lost embeddedness. Yeah? But that's all. So it's no longer an injective map, but it's still a continuous map. And this picture that's there, it essentially says that, I mean, what it's trying to indicate is that there's a circle and there's a pattern of identification on that circle, so bas which, which basically describes the sphere as a topological quotient space of that circle. So such continuous maps, these are in general called Cannon-Thurston maps, and uh, I'll try to promote some statement which is obviously false. Uh, basically saying that this Cannon-Thurston map serves the role of a Jordan curve theorem, even in the context of a space-filling curve. So basically, what is it? You have a continuous map. You don't think of the circle now sitting inside the sphere, but you think of it as sitting outside it, and you have a continuous map onto it. And from this map, you want to extract information which will serve the purpose of the Jordan curve theorem in, in the case of quasi-Fuchsian groups. Um, I should also say that this, uh, this theorem didn't arise in vacuum. It built on the work of a number of people, and uh, in particular, uh, Yair Minsky, uh, Kurt McMullen had proved the theorem for, for puncture torus groups, and uh, Brian Bowditch, and so on. <coughs> okay, um, so how I, I've made some. Uh, mystifying statements about how the Cannon-Thurston map serves the role of, a, of the Jordan curve theorems. How does it do that? So basically, uh, surfaces, I mean, this is a perspective, again, that was promoted by Thurston. Surfaces, when they start degenerating, when they go off to infinity in tight space, they limit on certain objects called laminations. So what's a lamination? A geodesic lamination on a hyperbolic surface is a foliation of a closed subset by geodesics. So it's a collection of, closed, a collection of geodesics, closed or not, um, such that the union of all these geodesics, I mean, the, the geodesics are pairwise disjoint, and the union of them is, it just forms a closed subset of your manifold, uh, of your two-dimensional surface. So Thurston associated to each degenerate end of this three-manifold, which is surface cross R, a lamination called, uh, called an ending lamination. Okay. So 
So, um, so there are two sets of laminations corresponding to the two infinities, and these are the laminations that you should think of as replacing the, the, the complex analytic structures that we had talked about earlier. What the scan thurston map does, so each lamination is now on a surface, it's a geodesic. If you lift to the universal cover, it's going to give you a bi-infinite geodesic in the hyperbolic plane. A bi-infinite geodesic in a hyperbolic plane has precisely two endpoints, right? So what the scan thurston map does, it identifies precisely those points coming from, so you have, say, ending lamination one, ending lamination two, corresponding to plus and minus infinity, those are going to give rise to various, I mean, each leaf is going to give rise to a pair of points on the circle. The Cannon Thurston map identifies precisely those. So here's the structure of the, of the Cannon Thurston map. So basically, this is the sense that I was, uh, oh boy. Oh, yeah. okay. So the Cannon Thurston map, it identifies precisely these endpoints. So, so what does that mean? So from this dynamics perspective on the Riemann sphere, you can recover precisely the asymptotics. So this, this gadget at infinity, which takes the place of a surrogate Riemann surface, that's sort of a topological object replacing the conformal guy. And from the Cannon Thurston map, you can recover that piece of information. All right. Now there's a fundamental theorem. Uh, this is uh, conjecture, this used to be a conjecture of Thurston, proved by Brock, Canary, and Minsky, which basically says that if you have one of these W degenerate manifolds, then the ending lamination determines the geometry of the manifold. It's a very deep theorem, fantastic theorem. Basically, it says that the asymptotics of the three manifold determines the geometry. So you have stuff which is happening at infinity, and you can interpolate a unique geometry between them. So uh, this was accomplished a little before Yair's uh, ICM talk in 2006, but well, it appeared much later in 2012. So now you put these two pieces of information together. Yeah? So from the dynamics, recover the ending lamination, apply the ending lamination theorem. So what you get as a result, the dynamics on the sphere at infinity, specifically on the limit set, it determines for you the geometry inside. So this is the dictionary that we were uh, referring to at the very beginning, that uh, um, there's an exact correspondence between the complex analytic or dynamic perspective and the geometric perspective. Okay, so that's the, so that's, that's sort of the, the slogan is dynamics implies and is implied by geometry. Uh, one genuinely dynamic consequence of this, and this is really a problem that predates Thurston, uh, what you immediately get is that these limit sets are locally connected, okay? So in the complex dynamic world, local connectivity is generally an issue, and that's, that's really where the problem started. Uh, okay, and a further generalization, which says that you don't need to stick to surface groups. You can look at arbitrary, finitely generated discrete subgroups of PSL2C, and essentially versions of this existence and structure of Cannon Thurston maps goes through. And exactly the naive analog that you would expect does go through. So the Cannon Thurston maps exist and they identify precisely ending laminations. Um, okay. Um, there's a, now I'll, I'll, I'll shift gears a little bit because uh, in the last few minutes, uh, what I want to talk about is implications of this outside of uh, the theory of Kleinian groups. So note that, uh, what did we really use about, um, ab 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 about the surface group? Namely, that it has a boundary, right? The surface group has a boundary, which is a circle. Hyperbolic three space has a boundary, which is a sphere. And we are asking for continuous maps from the circle to the sphere. Uh, so we can generalize uh, this question considerably of, of I mean, the, the question that was asked by Cannon and Thurston. So suppose you have a Gromov hyperbolic group. So these were introduced, I mean, the, by Gromov in the mid 80s. They've already appeared in Dennis Olsen's talk a few days back. So suppose you have a hyperbolic subgroup of a hyperbolic group. Once you have that inclusion of a subgroup in a group, 
assume that the finite generating set of the subgroup is contained in the finite generating set of the ambient group. Now, does the inclusion extend continuously to the boundary? Yeah. So does, for any pair of group and subgroup, hyperbolic, both hyperbolic, is there a canon Thurston map? And the answer in this generality is no. And the counterexample was found relatively recently. On the other hand, there are various special cases where the answer has been known to be affirmative for a while. And so in particular, if H is not just an arbitrary subgroup, but it's normal in the ambient group, then the answer is yes. It's also true for uh, certain natural um, ways of building, combining various groups together. Uh, namely, if you have a vertex subgroup, so, so you have a group acting on a tree of spaces, and H is, uh, corresponds to the stabilizer of the vertex group, you, there's, there's a combination theorem which was formulated and proved by Besvina and Fain in this context. So basically, take a finite graph. For every vertex, you associate a hyperbolic group. For every edge, you associate a hyperbolic group. So the group graph you're looking at is really the quotient of the Bassett tree. And even in th that setup, the answer is yes. OK. So now we'll, we'll come to something that's a uh, um, little more speculative. And uh, it's, it's going to relate to a couple of uh, talks that will be coming up uh, shortly. So I think Anna Wienhard will be talking sometime later today. Fanny Castle will be talking sometime later, later during the Congress. So where, where do we go from here? Okay. So we've been discussing surface group representations into PSL2C. That's, and we, we think we understand representations into PSL2R. And now I think we have a reasonably complete picture of representations into PSL2C. How about other semi-simple Lie groups? And uh, so these, these, these representations came from, um, they started off coming from a more algebraic geometry point of view due to Hitchin. And the more dynamical way of looking at these representations was given by Labouri. Yeah? So these are representations which are called Anosov representations. What's relevant to, the, to this talk is that these Anosov representations give rise to, uh, to pi 1s equivariant embeddings from the circle to g mod p. So g is your semi-simple Lie group, p is your parabolic, take the quotient g mod p. So in the case of SL2R, that g mod p is the circle, in the case of SL2C, G mod P is the sphere. Yeah? So what, uh, what these Anosov representations give you, these, they, are, they are pi 1s equivariant maps now from the circle thought of as the boundary of the, of the surface group to G mod P. So these Anosov representations may well be thought of as the analog of the quasi Fuchsian space. Okay. And as I mentioned, there's two groups of authors who contributed a lot to our understanding of these representations in recent times. Uh, Kapovich, Lieb, and Porti, one group, and another group consisting of Gurito, uh, Olivier Guichard, Fanny Castle, and Anna Wienhardt. Um, what, uh, there's, there's a, so what they did was, was I mean, the, the, there's a whole bunch of perspectives again, but what we have today is, I think, uh, moderately, at least a, a point of access to analogs of representations which, which correspond to quasi Fuchsian space. Um, so, what's left, and here's the, so I'll end with the, a couple of questions that uh, I certainly have no idea about. Um, what are the analog, what, are, what, what is the analog of elements of limiting representations in AH of S minus QF of S, okay? So let me just sort of back up a little bit and uh, say, say certain things that, um, that happened during the talk. So for example, in two dimensions, suppose you have no parabolics, yeah? 
then the representations are necessarily co-compact on the hyperbolic plane. When you go up one dimension to three-dimensional space, there is an analog of those, namely the, the convex co-compact or the quasi-Fuchsian representations. But in three dimensions, you have some genuinely new phenomenon happening, namely representations which degenerate to either simply or doubly degenerate representations. That class of representations has no real analog in dimension two. Yeah? So now we are going up dimensions further. Yeah? And we're really asking now, what are, uh, I mean, what are the elements, I mean, what, are, what is the general class uh, of representations that lie on the boundary of, of the analog of quasi-Fuchsian space? So if you have a sequence of Anusov representations and they limit to a representation, what kind of representation can it be? Um, now this might be, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly very open-ended, and uh, um, so let's, let's try to pose uh, another version of this, uh, which also uh, we do not know anything about, but, uh, um, but, but let, let, yeah, so let's, let's, let's pose this question. So if you, see, yeah, so again, rewinding a little bit, what was the difference between, so from the, from the point of view of asymptotics, what was the difference between quasi-Fuchsian representations and these degenerate representations? So the quasi-Fuchsian representations were characterized by a continuous embedding of the circle to the sphere. The Cannon-Thurston map perspective says that for arbitrary representations, including the rep uh, limiting representations, you get a continuous map not necessarily injective, for, uh, for representations, and, and you get a map from the circle into the sphere. So from a certain point of view, you could define Anosov representations as those which are, which are quasi-isometrically embedded and which give rise to this uh, equivariant, uh, homeomorphism, uh, uh, um, equivariant embedding from the circle to the to G mod P, the, the first number boundary. Now, if you relax injectivity there, yeah? so basically try for a definition where you still retain uh, continuity, basically saying that uh, you have an analog of the canon thurston map, say, uh, quote, call it, call it what you will, higher canon thurston map or whatever, and just say that you still have a continuous pi 1s equivariant map from the circle to G mod yeah, B stands for Borel, P stands for parabolic, whichever, whichever one you like. And suppose if you relax the embedding to just a continuous map and, the, and ask the question, what representations do you get? There's, there's a way of cheating here, basically by introducing parabolics. So I should specify that uh, what we are really talking about here are representations without any new parabolics. Okay? And uh, so, I, so basically, uh, I wanted to end by uh, making public my ignorance and saying that uh, I have absolutely no idea what, these, what kind of answers we can possibly ex expect for these questions. So I think I have half a minute left, so I'll stop here. Thank you.